Welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed your break. Uh, this panel, we are going to host great dignitaries, uh, which I will introduce them to you in a few minutes. Uh, I want to say my name is Marin Manucharian. I am here on behalf of Advisory Council on Youth of Council of Europe, and I'm also the member of the steering group of the symposium. At this panel, we have the honor to host Ms. Nezhana Samarjic Markovic, the Director General of Democracy at the Council of Europe, on my left. On my right, uh, I have Tibor Navracic, Commissioner for Education, C Culture, Youth and Sport in the European Commission. And I have Laszlo Sabu, Parliamentary State Secretary and the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Republic of Hungary. Welcome, and I will uh, give them the floor uh, one by one. And at first, we will have the honor to hear to Snežana Samarjic Markovic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and the podium Thank is you, yours. Thank you, Marin. Oh, I shouldn't forget your notes. <laughs> Commissioner Navracic, Deputy Minister Sabo, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is particularly satisfying to witness the interest generated by this symposium, Youth Participation in a Digital World, which gathers together so many experts, key players, and activists to reflect on opportunities, but also on threats that the digital agenda holds for young people today, in particular with regard to their participation in all spheres of life. The promotion of young people and their active participation in democratic processes and structures, as well as equal opportunities for the participation of all young people in all aspects of their everyday life, is a key element and one of the Council of Europe's sector's priorities over the next years. This is an objective we also share with the European Union and is reflected in the program of our partnership in the field of youth. The Youth Partnership is an excellent example of fruitful, long-lasting, actually more than 16 years, cooperation. It has allowed increasing knowledge and understanding of the situation and the needs of young people to identify challenges and formulate conclusions for policy and for practice. Commissioner Navracic's presence here is the testimony of his personal commitment and support as EU Commissioner for our partnership and is in his previous office as Hungarian Minister for the European Youth Center here in Budapest. I welcome also the presence of hundreds of participants through virtual means, as well as the members of the Joint Council of Youth, the pool of European researchers and European Knowledge Center for Youth Policy, who actively contribute to knowledge sharing and have linked their annual meetings to this event. Fostering democratic innovation and participation and building inclusive societies, including through the promotion of cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue, are part of the core mission of the Directorate General for Democracy and also for the entire Council of Europe. It is important to empower and to protect, protect young people, to support their autonomy, and to improve their access to rights with particular attention to vulnerable groups and minorities in our societies. The work we do in this field obviously also includes young migrants and refugees. Any person arriving in the territory of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe is entitled to fundamental rights enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights and there, ca there can be no derogation. We pay tribute to the staff of the public authorities and the thousands of volunteers who provide support and immediate assistance in full respect of human rights standards and the human dignity of the people who come to our continent in search of a dignified and safe life. It is our belief that diversity is a challenge and migration a phenomenon 
which we have to live with. That is why we have a big responsibility in creating the conditions to transform a situation of crisis in an opportunity for growth and for development. Clearly, life in the 21st century is no longer imaginable without virtual media and tools and of course, digital again agenda from this perspective is topical. There are indeed complex challenges to face when it comes to youth participation in a digital world. And this symposium should allow reflecting on key areas such as the relevance of the digital agenda for the communication, education, and economic spheres, as well as working life. Reflections on youth participation and democratic governance go far beyond encouraging young people only to vote in elections. Our common project is to create a democratic culture which allows young people to participate in decision-making, to be active and autonomous citizens, to enjoy their human and social rights to the full, and be respectful and supportive of the rights of the other. The topic of this symposium links quite naturally also to reflections over various Council of Europe activities and instruments, and I would like to underline only three of the most important ones. The first, let's say, is the annual World Forum for Democracy. As some of you know, the forum gathers together leaders, opinion makers, civil society activists, representatives of business, acad academia, media, and professional groups to debate on key challenges for democracy worldwide. Every year, we invite a substantial number of young people to ensure a high level of youth participation during the forum. Last year's theme was, from participation to influence, can youth revitalize democracy? And that was particularly relevant to the role of young people in our societies. And in November this year, 20, 75 young participants will take part in the forum dedicated to the theme this time the theme is freedom versus control for a democratic response. The 2014 forum also made clear how digitalization widened the gap between generations. It is not by chance that one of the youth sector's priorities for 2016 and 17 will be innovative forms of youth participation for four decades, youth participation has been core of the youth sector's work. Together with our co-management statutory bodies, we evaluate and respond to young people's needs and aspirations, and we promote access to decision-making. At the same time, we are fully aware that international institutions do not exploit the communication tools of the digital natives to the full. We trust the symposium will identify tendencies and provide the prognosis on how to develop the future ag agenda and also of our own organization's participation structures and mechanisms. You are surely aware that my director general, and of course I personally, have committed to the follow-up of the declaration of the second European Youth Work Convention. We have already started the work to draft a committee of ministers recommendation on the role of youth work in upholding human rights and democracy. During this ambitious endeavor, we need to bring together the existing know-how of youth research, youth policy, and youth work practice and situate it in the digital agenda of the 21st century. That was the first activity. The second, you are familiar with another flagship activity, namely the No Hate Speech Movement campaign. A youth campaign for human rights online, aiming to counter hate speech in all its forms and to develop online youth participation and citizenship, including in internet governance processes. 
I'm pleased to see that the no hate speech movement will be subject of discussion in one of the labs of this symposium. When the campaign was proposed by the youth sector as early as 2009, there was still little awareness and little knowledge about these phenomena. But the crisis and the threat Europe is fi facing show again how much the internet can be used or rather abused to spread fear and hate and to influence in particular the youth. Our objective is to use the digital world equally active to disseminate positive messages and promote human rights and democratic values. After two years of campaign, the Committee of Ministers has decided to include this campaign in its action plan on the fight against violent extremism and radicalization leading to terrorism and ex expand the campaign until 2017. Third, the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime. It is actually the first international treaty on crimes committed on internet and other computer networks. And you may know that it was opened for signature here in Budapest 2001. And we call it Budapest Convention. It fe features an additional protocol concerning the criminalization of acts of a racist and xenophobic nature committed through computer systems. We want to ensure that internet provides a safe and an open environment where freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, diversity, culture, education and knowledge can flourish, while privacy, human dignity, security of information, and protection of personal data are guaranteed. Let me also say that this symposium can be inscribed in the larger context of Council of Europe action in the field of, broadly speaking, new technologies and internet governance. A global Council of Europe strategy on internet governance for the period 2016 to 2019 is in preparation. The matter touching transversality almost all areas of our program of activities. There are many initiatives in the pipeline, notably as regards uh, roles and responsibilities of internet intermediaries, the human rights implication of computer generated data processing, the challenge of digitalization for access and participation in culture. I would like to mention in particular two projects the initiative of our education department on digital citizenship education, which aims at contributing to reshape the role of formal education for the creation of digital citizenship, and another project called Internet Literacy of our Children's Rights Division. The proposal for the extent of No Hate Speech Movement campaign also includes an evidence-based research dimension and the drafting of counter-narratives to hate speech. If I can synthesize our reflection underlying this symposium, I would say the following. We do welcome the unprecedented opportunities the digital world offers. It's a promise of freedom. We do not also restrain from welcoming the idea that internet services should be accessible and affordable, not least to ensure a wide participation. At the same time, our societies become increasingly vulnerable to risk in particular cybercrime, but also spreading racist and sexist contents. Recruiting and training extremists via the internet, also sexual exploitation and abuse of children, and illegal collection and use of personal data and hate speech. In fact, everybody might be exposed to risk, such as surveillance, harassment, stalking, 
bullying, identity theft, or manipulation. The natural openness of youth to the new technologies only amplifies the opportunities, but also the threats. Your work during this symposium will be particularly le relevant to define the areas where future research and knowledge development are needed to enhance our understanding of the digital world and the specific, specific perspective of youth participation in it. Before concluding, and as Deputy Minister Sabo will not be with us tonight to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the, this very youth uh, center here in Budapest, I would like to take already now the occasion to express our gra gratitude for the great support that the successive Hungarian governments have been providing to the center throughout the years, even before the center was opened in 1995. I'm confident that the networks and dynamics which will result from this event will give new impetus to the work of our youth sector, in particular in the youth policy, youth work, and youth research domains. The members of steering group set up by the youth partnership with the EU to prepare this symposium made an excellent work in terms of contents and expertise, and we thank them for their commitment. The active participation of all of you will be a key element to fruitful results. Of course, I'm looking forward and with interest to seeing the results of this symposium, and I can assure you that the Council of Europe, in partnership with the EU, will take good care of them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Markovic. Uh, I pass the floor to Mr. Navracic to address his opening speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to join you at this symposium here in this country, which is my home country, in this city, which obviously has a special place in my heart. And it is in this building which just celebrates the 20th anniversary. Because uh, the past 20 years, the Council of Europe Youth Center here in Budapest has been a space to discuss democracy and freedom for Europe's youth. Today's event, jointly organized by the European Commission and the Council of Europe, gives us another opportunity to do this. Today's topic is a wider one for everybody working with young people. How can young people participate in our increasingly digitized world? How can they use digital to find their place in society? And what implications does the digital shift have for those trying to reach out to and working with young people? The internet and social media are changing democratic participation and the dynamics of politics in ways that we cannot yet fully understand. We have all seen how fast people can now organize a protest or how a Twitter storm can surge from nowhere. But what will be the long-term effects? We have seen how social media can be used to build campaigns and bring people together to push for change. The Obama election campaign in 2008 the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Arab Spring all come to mind. At the same time, we see that many young people turn away from traditional forms of democracy, such as voting in elections or joining political parties. We, the politicians, the youth workers, educators, academics, have to accept and adapt to the reality that young people are today acting differently in the democratic era, arena. But that is easier said than done. Of course, this new world offers obvious advantages. 
You can reach millions with one simple click of a mouse, and you can share information literally at the speed of light. Yet, the internet also has a darker side. Everyone can be active online in an almost unlimited way. Some people abuse the internet to bully others, to spread propaganda and hate speech, or to carry out criminal and terrorist activities. The reality is that these people and organizations are hard to stop. Moreover, contrary to popular belief, not all young people actually have access to the internet. And of those who are connected, not everyone is digitally competent. Young Europeans may be growing up in the digital era, but not all of them are able to use new technologies in a confident, critical, and creative way. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to help revitalize youth participation in the digital age. My aim is to engage with at least one million young people during my term as commissioner. And I will only be able to succeed with the help of online channels. Over the coming months, I will create online spaces where young people can debate the issues that are important to them, where they can voice their thoughts and ideas about the big challenges facing Europe today. I want to create spaces that are open and interactive, that allow for discussion and disagreement, spaces that help me in my political work as well. I want to collaborate with and learn from youth workers and experts. And of course, I'm looking to work with young people themselves. Young Europeans are amongst the most active users of digital media, and they understand the challenges around e-participation very well. Nearly half of them say that social networks mean progress for democracy because everyone can take part in public debate. However, more than 40% also say that the digital age poses a risk for democracy. They fear how personal data can be abused. And in a study on trends on, in participation, young people agree that digital tools are helpful for communication. But they make a point of stating that they cannot replace face-to-face -face contact. Rather, young people connect the two. They see the smart use of online tools as a gateway to participation in the real world. At EU level, we have started to digitize our own tools. The Structured Dialogue, our main forum for engaging with young people in EU policy, gives any young person the chance to make their point. We have recently created new online spaces, which we hope will bring many more young people on board. We have also piloted new, more flexible forms of participation. <laughs> During European Youth Week in May of this year, we organized Ideas Labs. Young people across Europe came forward with their own proposals for topics such as employment or involvement in civil society. Their ideas were published online, giving others the opportunity to rate them. Our efforts have enabled us to double the number of participants in the structural dialogue over the past five years to around 40,000. This is good progress, but we need to do much more. In particular, we need to reach out to those on the sidelines. More than 13 million young Europeans are not in employment, education, or training. Some never vote, have no trust in public institutions, and <coughs> never participate in social or civic activities. There are young people who lack a sense of belonging. They no longer feel at home in our communities, in our Western democracies. Or worse, they are attracted to radicalization and violent extremism. This worries me deeply. In a couple of months, the Commission and Member States will agree on new priorities for EU youth policy until 2018. I want us to give priority to the inclusion of all young people in school, at work, and as active citizens in democratic life. I want all young people to have the opportunity to live fulfilling lives, and I want all to have a political voice. We have to act on different fronts at the same time. We need open channels of participation to reach more young people from all backgrounds. 
We need to help young people acquire the skills to participate. This includes digital literacy, but also media and civic skills and an ability to critically evalu evaluate any kind of information. And we have to mobilize everyone who can support young people, policymakers, youth workers, and other practitioners, so that we work together across policy areas and across countries. At EU level, we will use our Erasmus Plus program in a more targeted way to promote civic values, citizenship, and intercultural understanding. This will enable us to boost exchanges between youth organizations, practitioners, and policymakers to address problems like, like exclusion and radicalization. We can all learn from each other. The European Union is probably facing its toughest challenge yet. Conflict, terrorism, and unprecedented numbers of migrants are straining our social fabric. How do we maintain open, tolerant societies in which people find their place and live peacefully with each other? This question is more urgent than ever. We need to find answers. And young people have a particularly vital role to play here. They are the future of Europe. And I want to ensure they can shape that future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Navratic, for very inspiring words. Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Sabo. Mr. Director General, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a story. A couple of weeks ago, I checked out the website TED. I, I'm not sure if you know TED.com. I highly recommend it if you haven't visited this. Uh, the brilliant speakers of today and the future probably, they are having speeches and, and the, the winners are usually posted on this website and uh, you can just browse them. It's probably more useful than just browsing Google. So if you go for TED, you will find quality there. And one of the speakers uh, I bumped into recently was talking about uh, digitalization of underprivileged kids. Uh, this gentleman comes from MIT. He's originally Indian, but he's a professor at MIT. And he made an experience experiment. He went back to his home village where there's hardly any electricity, no computers whatsoever. So he left three computers in his village with internet access. And uh, he showed the kids who hardly could speak any English or hardly knew the letters to read. Uh, he showed them how to turn on the computer and how to uh, put a search engine in action. And he asked them to learn about the human body. But there was no teacher in the village who could teach computers and no teacher of English either. So he went back four or five months later and he asked the guys, the little guys, okay guys, so how, how could you deal with this computer? Do you have any problems in how to, how to manage this computer? And one of the girls put up her hands and he, she said, Yes, mister, I have a problem. So what is your problem? I just still haven't figured it out. How did desoxyribonucleic acid passes through the cell membrane through replication? <laughs> wow. So this is what kids can do with digital technology when it's turned to good causes. And we should not underestimate the will of young people to discover, to learn for their benefit and for their, uh, for their partner's uh, benefit. Uh, this is really a, a true story, and I hope that this type of experiences uh, can be replicated, so don't become experiences, but they become a strategy. The Hungar Hungary is uh, part uh, of the European Commission, member of the European Commission, or the, the Council of Europe, for 25 years now, and as we heard, as the first uh, former communist country, we have been host uh, for this uh, European Youth Centre for 20 years now. And I have to say the activities that are happening here are really serving the Council of Europe as, as an engine, as a brain uh, for the future. So the work this center and you yourselves are doing here is not only learning about human rights, learning about the rule of law and democracy. It's all about how to create a future that we can all trust in, how to create uh, equal access 
to wealth, to knowledge, uh, and digitalization and computer technology in general is uh, all about that. Promoting human rights and democracy is really something that cannot be taught in schools. This is something that has to be emotionally uh, learned. And uh, I believe we all have very important roles in spreading uh, the desire in people to learn about democracy, human rights, and rule of law. I hope that the active participation of, of young people uh, will be more and more required by politics, uh, not only in Europe, but overall in the world. However, there's a significant challenge here. As Commissioner Navracic mentioned, uh, the young generations, they don't necessarily like classical conventional politics. They don't necessarily want to join political parties. Uh, quite the contrary. They, they are trying to influence the world without being member of formal, uh, formal unions and societies and political parties. So how can we achieve attraction to these uh, wonderful ideas? Probably one of the best non-conventional ways of attracting young people is the digital technology. But how to create that attraction, how to bring away the young kids from just simply playing games of, on PlayStation or, or uh, looking for really stupid things on the internet, how we can attract them so that they really serve a purpose, uh, for a better purpose for humanity, that's a very interesting challenge to do. So, the government, the Hungarian government, is trying to do its best uh, to take a little part in this, in this direction. Uh, let me read you a couple of numbers uh, from a recent uh, uh, representative survey of the Hungarian people. Uh, young people were basically tested and, uh, and sampled between 15 and 24 years, uh, and we were checking the access to digital technology. It turned out that that was actually a surprising number for me. More than 80% of households have at, at least one desktop uh, in their homes. 52% uh, have laptops at home, and 10% of Hungarian people have tablets. 59% of Hungarian youth have smartphones, and almost half of them, 45%, uh, has mobile internet uh, access on their phones. The average young person in Hungary spends two and a half hours on the internet per day. We don't know the exact content, what they are looking at, at the moment. <laughs> However, we know that there's no equal access uh, to internet and digital technology in Hungary. That's why I'm very happy to share with you that there's two programs, the Digital Hungary program and the National Info Communication Strategy uh, that are both aimed at enhancing digital infrastructure in Hungary. The objective is uh, to have at least 30 megabit per second uh, internet access in every single household in Hungary by the year of 2018. And we believe this is a realistic expectation. Of course, in big cities it's not a big deal, but in smaller rural communities where there's lots of underprivileged kids, that's a challenge. We already have computers in every single primary schools, and hopefully more and more homes will be equipped uh, with modern technologies. The ICT sector in Hungary uh, is becoming really a powerhouse. Uh, in the last eight years, uh, this part of our economy uh, tripled. Approximately 10% of the GDP is coming from the ICT sector. 100,000 people are directly employed by the ICT sector, and this means actually 5% of all enterprises in Hungary, meaning 20,000 companies. We are very proud that uh, For Forbes magazine, in, this, uh, in its uh, June issue, uh, identified Hungary as a hidden champion for establishing startups in, in Hungary. We believe uh, that these type of initiatives, uh, especially if they can be replicated in other European countries and uh, in the rest of the world, will really move us forward uh, to have a more powerful young generation who are able and capable of managing what they found on the internet. They will be managed uh, to influence politicians and decision makers on a big scale and hopefully create a better life for us and for our children and for our grandchildren. So I wish you all the best uh, for this symposium. 
I wish you happy birthday, happy 20th birthday here in Hungary, and I hope you will really have meaningful and deep discussions in the next couple of hours and days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sabu, for such inspiring talk. I actually recently discovered that even the shepherds in the Armenian mountains post selfies from the mountains, so <laughs> you can always be surprised what IT can do to people. Um, thank you very much for this inspiring talks. And I actually, uh, before we go on with our agenda, I want to say that it's already a big achievement to have so many institutions, governments on board with the IT agenda. And I think this symposium itself is, an, is kind of an example of such uh, achievement, uh, such actions. And you went beyond the political will. It took some courage also to have an action on the place. And I hope that this will be an inspiring uh, uh, point for us to actually carry on with the symposium, make it a big success for the next two days. So please check on hashtag YPDW15 on Twitter to make sure that you can also catch up with the progress we have here. It's on Twitter. <laughs> uh, and yes, thank you very much again for coming and joining us this afternoon. Um, before we go on, I want to make a small announcement. Please, after the session is finished, uh, make sure to gather downstairs near the big chessboard where we will continue with the a little getting to know each other part uh, with our facilitators. And if there are any other announcements technical, I can give you the floor. If not, thank you for your attention and you're free to go. Mm. Perfect timing. Um, just make sure to go there now. Do not disappear on the way. Uh, the facilitators will wait for you downstairs. Okay.